show me <laughs> that we sit in the presence of our King. So many times we come and we we do the necessities, the basics, we do the protocol. But I desire to be in it in the frequency with heaven. So when we worship, we become unconventional, we become free, we can find the frequency this, of, of where the Holy Spirit is hovering. We can get into that flow, it's like a river that carries you. When you get into the frequency,
I'm amazed. I am amazed. I am amazed. We are grateful to know you this way. Holy Spirit, while you have us arrested, Hands up and sit yes. Take us to the secret place. Yes. Take us to the secret place. I want to go. Mm.
the presence of the Lord keeps me the Bibles. Lord, we thank you. Please do not shift in any way out of this very sensitive place. Let's turn to the book of James, chapter 5. Oh, how holy is our God. Before we begin, does everyone have a card? Raise your hand. If you do not have a card, you have entries. Raise your hand. If you do not have a card, we're going to confuse it at the end of the message. Upstairs, do you have a card upstairs? Yes. All my ushers have a card. Praise God. What our Heavenly Father told me is from the front door to the back, from the offices to the fellowship hall, everyone is called to participate. James chapter 5. I'm going to read four verses in your hearing, verses 13 through 16. And it reads, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Uh -huh. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Right. Is anyone among you sick? Uh -huh. Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Uh -huh. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is power and faith. Verse 16 is our focus. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. This is um, <laughs> one of those times where um, I have my own little cute message I want to preach. And uh, the Holy Spirit blocked me. So this is what I am to bring. And so I'm here out of obedience. So our word for today is confession and forgiveness. Good for the soul, good for the whole. Confession and forgiveness. Good for the soul, good for the whole. God in heaven, I am dependent on you. I promised a long time ago that I would obey. So here I am. Lord, I thank you in advance for the word that is transformative. <laughs> Holy Spirit, have your way. Thank you, Father. We love you, Lord. We desperately need you. We desperately need you. Holy Spirit, touch us and give us a feeling of safety and peace. At the heart of the matter is true freedom and liberty. That's what you're dying for. So thank you. Give you glory. Give you honor. And we, this body of believers, this community of faith, we give you praise. It is in Jesus' name that I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Glory to God. The Holy Spirit is moving. 
God is in control. Yes. And I'm not in the pilot seat. I'm in the passenger seat beside one of y'all. I'm just a vessel that is using pilot of a major airline had to do a crash landing in a field. I believe it was six people that died, two of which were the crew members. The first officer of the flight, the co-pilot, ended up losing his leg. He's never able to fly again. And as with any crash, there was an investigation into the crash to determine the cause of the crash. It was subsequently found that an old part finally gave away and broke off, causing something in the tail area to lock and immediately throw this plane into a nosedive. Records indicated that this part had been marked for replacement many months prior but was overlooked and never addressed. Case solved. However, the pilot had issues of his own that this crash landing pushed to the forefront. The night prior to the flight, the pilot had enjoyed a good night he was drinking and drugging all night long with one of the flight attendants, only catching a few hours of sleep before having to get up in the morning. And so to take care of his hangover the next morning, he snorted a line of cocaine and proceeded to go to the airport. While in flight, he came out of the flight deck to make an announcement to the passengers over the intercom system, welcome them to the flight, letting them know how long the flight would be, inviting them to sit back and relax. And the whole time that he's giving the announcement, with one hand, the other hand, he is opening up three vodka bottles and pouring them into orange juice, where the passengers can't see. All of this, while at the wheel of a plane that was preparing to give out. While in the hospital, a routine toxicology test was taken of all the crew members, which is, which is normal, and the pilot was included. Of course, it was soon discovered that this pilot was drunk, very drunk, and high while flying this plane. The higher-ups knew immediately that they had a problem. This was going to cost them a lot of money. The families would have the right to sue them now that this report has illuminated an issue with one of their employees, the pilot, no doubt, who's flying the plane, so never mind the broken part. This issue here now takes precedence. There was a drunk pilot that landed this broken plane. And even though they simulated the landing with at least 10 other so sober pilots, no one else could actually land the plane without killing everybody. But somehow this drunk pilot was able to save the majority of passengers. So now Operation Cover Up begins. The attorney worked feverishly to get the toxicology report thrown out, and he was successful. The union rep tried to help this pilot get clean, at least until the deposition was over. Everybody was working to hide the fact that this pilot was drunk. What they did was help to continue the lie that this man had been telling himself 
for years that he did not have a problem and that he could continue on in this manner and that he didn't have a drinking problem, that he wasn't an alcoholic. So isn't it easier for us to focus on our successes than to look at our weaknesses? Mm. Wouldn't we all prefer to celebrate our triumphs than look at our losses? Isn't it easier to focus on the applause from the passengers at the end of a safely landed flight rather than the absolutely chaotic night that you had the night before? And this is just from a stranger to stranger perspective. But we are guilty of the same facades in our closer relationships. Amen? In the midst of the sanctuary, where we come together and we sing songs like freedom and victory, are we clapping with one hand and holding up our masks with the other? How hard do we try to hide our struggles from people that we say that we love? People that we share our lives with, so we say. People that we say we join together with in community. People that we serve together with. We praise and worship our God together with. But we never feel safe enough to get naked. We never feel safe enough to be vulnerable before each other. We just continue to fly the plane drunk and high, never thinking that one day that plane may just get out on us, exposing what's been going on the entire time. Last Sunday, Dr. Thompson preached a passionate message about spiritual disciplines, and of which there are many. He hit five, and there are many more, but this week, I have been led by the Spirit of God to continue in that vein and minister on the spiritual discipline of confession and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Many of us, when we hear the word confession, we think of the Roman Catholic Church, right? <laughs> we get a picture of someone going into a closet-like space and speaking anonymously to a priest who's on the other side of the wall. They're sharing their sins and they're looking for a remedy that would absolve the soul of the guilt that weighs that person down. So in our context, we may scoff at the idea because after all, only Jesus can forgive sin. In our context, that's a foreign method because we just take it to Jesus and leave it there. Hallelujah. But here is a question that I have for us today. When we have imagined that confession scene with the person in the closet-like space saying, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. How many times have you envisioned the person who is sitting in the confessor's chair as the actual priest. Have you ever seen the priest on the other side of the wall? Probably not. Probably not, but what has happened is we have a skewed sense of community. We have a skewed sense of community. Somewhere along the way, we have been trained in our thinking that though we quote the scripture, all have sinned that come short of the glory of God, we have created hierarchies that place people and positions in certain categories. Okay? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but we've got to put the clergy over here. If we're going to put Sister Pastor over here, we're going to put the Pastor over here. Oh Lord, the bishop's so high. Mm. Up there, we've got the box for the evangelist. 
I don't have thoughts. <laughs> but we have created these hierarchies. And the irony is that it is impossible to place others in certain boxes without placing yourself in one as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, don't put your pocketbook down. <laughs> it's, it's impossible to place people in these boxes. So we imprison our loving community. We imprison one another with our silent affirmation of worshiping with each other from the safety of our prisons. I'll say it again. We imprison the community with our silent affirmation of worshiping from our prisons. We condone the lies. Oh my God. This is the alternative that we have chosen instead of living in true community. A place where we are all free to fall and we're free to fail, and we're free to ask our brother and our sister for help to get back up. Whoa. Wow. What a concept. What a concept. Freedom to fall, and then freedom to reach out and say, hey brother, I've fallen. Can you help me get back up? Hey sister. I fall. Can you help me? Can you help me get back up? Freedom. I've fallen. The discipline of confession is not possible unless we're able to embrace the truth that I fall. I've fallen. We stand in need of forgiveness every day. And some days are worse than others. Some days are heavier than others. Some days are more egregious than others. Some days are more sorrowful than others. When we are walking in the discipline of confession, we are not satisfied with this cliche. If there is anything that I have done that has offended you, Lord, please forgive me. Come, come on. We got the protocol together. When you pray, first you ask for forgiveness. I'm going to put that blanket statement out there. If there's anything that I've done that was not like you, Lord, touch my heart. Now let's move on. When we miss the mark or when we commit life diminishing behavior, that, that's sin, life diminishing behavior. As a believer, it is not an out of body experience. <laughs> I came to check, it's not something that happens to you. We are aware. Not only is God aware, but we are aware. And so confession is more than lip service. Yes. If there's anything that's not like you, no, no, you know. You're very clear. You remember it. You can replay it, recount it, wrote it in your journal. But we, don't, we, we think if we don't really put a name to it. Okay. We're comfortable with thinking that we can just throw the blanket over the dirt so when the friends come over, okay, okay, this is not my word, this is God's word, this is not mine, but we're comfortable with that to where we are in false community. 
false community. Mm -hmm. Confession is a discipline that is a part of really living the incarnation. Mm -hmm. So let me explain that to you. How do we live the incarnation of God coming and living in the flesh? Okay, living the incarnation means actually living in the body and not only our own bodies, but also in the corporate body of the believing community. See, we think that we can have residence on the outskirts of the community and we'll jump in when the parties are going on, when the celebrations are going on. But when you know that something has happened in your house, you back out. <laughs> we back out. Oh, I'm going to come to the best in his presence. What time? 5.30. I'm going to be there. But then, when I have sinned against God, I'm not going to come to church. What time? To the club. Because we're not fully living in the body. We're living with the body, but not in, Ooh, in the body. God. Oh, God. Did you hear that? We're living with the body, but not in the body. Not in the body. It's a presence that invites everyone in this community to live free from carnality. In the four verses that I read, we see a formula for living in community in such a way that everyone benefits from the gift of community. Do we realize that this is a gift that Jesus has given us? He didn't just die for the individual. He died for the whole. Okay? This is a gift that we get to enjoy. That we don't have to suffer as, as, as to be isolated because we believe in Christ. But we have freedom to come together. And they may call us radical. They may call us crazy. But at least we got one's another. At least we in this thing to get, come on somebody, come on somebody. You know how it is. You got you in your, in your age, you're like, that's all right. We're good. As long as we have one another together in this thing, we don't care that the world calls us fanatical. We don't care that the world doesn't understand. All we do is try to share what we have. Come on. But we gotta be in community. In community. And so we're free, freed up from living in carnality. So there are things that we do as individuals in the midst of the community. What does it say? It says, if any of you are in trouble, pray. Right? Mm -hmm. And then it says, if you're happy, let us all bring for it. Go ahead and sing a little ditty for us. <laughs> Catch your A and B selection. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. And then he says, if you're sick in your body, call for the elders. It says, if any among you are sick, call for the elders to come and pray with you and anoint you with oil and by faith, you will receive your healing. Yes, yes. As both you and the elders are praying by faith. So come on, let me just dig that out. Yeah. We working with your faith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to bring some faith to the party. <laughs> you got to bring some faith to the altar, okay? Well, have me sweating and snotting and crying and you ain't got no faith. You, you, you got to come with something. I'm going to add mine to yours. Oh, come on, somebody. And so both of 
us, all of us are operating in faith and you receive healing. But what about when the sickness is in your seat? We don't have a problem asking somebody to come pray for my hip. It's acting a little funny. It's Kenny Wampa. get locked up every now and again. Come on, lay your hands right there. Get your all. Come on, lay your hands right there. <laughs> but what about your filthiness? Oh, man. Now the oil ain't got no power. Now we don't need no prayer. No, I ain't gonna need to see no elders today. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. See, we equate this only with sickness in your physical. Can I teach today? But there's other sickness that we carry. That the Lord invites us to come together as community to say, brother, I've fallen. Can you help me get up? I'm struggling. Can you help me get up? In the same way that the faithful prayers are sent up in agreement on behalf of your diseases, these same prayers are powerful enough to heal our sin sickness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not, what's not being said here is that sickness and sin automatically go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's saying here. You see the word if. If. When we regard iniquity in our heart, many of you, how many of you know that if you do have unconfessed, unrepentant sin, in your body, it can manifest. In physical infirmity. Okay, I'm gonna, I don't leave nobody out. I'm coming over here. <laughs> Although, not automatically the sin and physical sickness go together. Sometimes, if we continue to walk with unrepentant, unconfessed sin, that will begin to manifest in your physical body. It has the potential. You got migraines. You got back locking up. You got stomach pain. You've got these tumors in your stomach. You've got ulcers that are growing up on the inside. And you know you still hate your sister from something she did in 88. But you want to come and ask me to pray for your ulcer. But the Holy Spirit says, no, no. <laughs> What I need you to do is humble thyself before the presence of God and allow the oil of the Holy Ghost to flow over your life so that this burden can be lifted off of you and then instantly I can touch you and you'll be healed when your heart is corrected. <coughs> mm, this is not my word. This is not my word. No, no, beloveds. We gotta, we, we, we gotta do this thing right. Mm -hmm. We gotta do this thing right. Mm -hmm. When we regard iniquity in our heart and we do not repent, we can have all kinds of issues coming up. And I believe that one time Dr. Thompson tells a story. I have to tell his story because I don't actually have one like this. So um, he ministered to a young lady and she was having extreme physical ailments and the Holy Spirit revealed to him if I'm remembering it correctly that uh, the sister had unforgiveness in her heart and so she was not going to be released from that pain until, whoo, God, until she surrendered that unforgiveness uh -huh, uh -huh. see the root of it 
was not the pork, not the sugar. The root was the unforgiveness. You can be vegan, pescatarian, you can drink water 40 days and 40 nights, but if your heart ain't right, get you a burger. I just want to talk plain. <laughs> we we master the superficial. Oh God. We master the superficial. Okay. Apostle James is asking us to live in community. He's saying, don't hold that in. Come together and say. Listen here, servants. Listen here, brothers and sisters. I got a, I got a problem. And I'm struggling. Can you help me on my homeless journey? Because I'm tired. I'm tired and I'm bitter now. I'm tired. I don't want to lose my faith. But I don't know how to transition. I don't know how to move. I feel like I pray but for some reason. I just can't move forward. I'm broken. Can help me achieve my healing now, now, now. I, I hear. Some of y'all were saying, uh-huh, Pastor Adams, I take all my burdens to the Lord and I leave them there. Mm. And I can understand that thinking because it's saved. Mm. <laughs> There's no true risk mm. with that. It allows you to hold your status, your position. It allows you to keep It allows you to keep coming in, looking like it's all put together. <laughs> Knowing that if somebody touch your little matchstick building that you done made, it'll all come crashing down. I carry my burdens to the Lord too. I tell Jesus all about my troubles. And I believe that Jesus, he will fix it after a while. But I want us to be real with ourselves and think on this question. Are we just taking our burdens to Jesus? Or are we also taking our wickedness? Are we also taking our filth? Are we also taking our wretchedness? I know we I know we taking our, our job requests. I know, I know we're bringing that. I know we're bringing our new house request. I know we're bringing that save that other sister request. Well, come on. But are we bringing our God help me because my heart is black. Help me because I am straight up wrong. And I know it. And I've been wrong for many years. Are we really bringing those requests when we're bringing our burdens? How many times have we come to Jesus head bowed and body bent? Crying out to the Lord, declaring, Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me out of this body of sin? How often do we throw ourselves on the altar and through tears we, we cry out to the Lord and say, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to 
be like this. I don't want to think like this no more. I don't want to be a sower of discord. I don't want to be a backbiter no more. How many times? Come on. I know we're praying for unsaved loved ones, but don't forget the trespasses. <laughs> this is not my word. This is God's word. But if we can be honest, I believe that we have learned how to have communion with the Heavenly Father, but never experienced conviction. Wow. Wow. Not with the Father. Without conviction, there is no change. I'm not talking about condemnation. I'm talking about conviction. I'm talking about a godly sorrow that causes us to weep. A pricking of the heart whereby we experience the precious and loving guidance of the Holy Spirit that ever so gently maneuvers us through this process of becoming. That's where we are. We're in a process of becoming. We don't know now what we shall be, but we are becoming. And if we allow the precious Holy Spirit to gently guide us, to take us by the shoulders and, 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 and guide us and navigate us, not just to, not just to the material stuff, but, but to a cleaner heart, to a right spirit, to pure hands, undefiled before God. That's what confession is. Gifts, G-I-F-T-S, gifts us. The precious Holy Spirit that will lead us and develop our spiritual ears so that we can hear the whistle of the Holy Spirit who is the umpire of our souls, who whispers, foul. That was out of bounds. Mm -mm, you crossed the line. Go back and get that right. Go back and make that right. It's when we are open to this discipline that we'll be able to discern and it'll come quicker. I'm not talking about never, never cross. I'm not talking about never sinning. I'm talking about what happens when we do, when we miss the mark. There is an expectation from God that we go and we follow in his leading. The Holy Spirit says, don't do that. It's a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful, beautiful gift. Because what happens is we end up backing ourselves into a prison of condemnation. And so you swear everybody's looking at you <laughs> you swear everybody knows your dirt. Come on, somebody. You swear the whole church know, and we don't, and we don't want to know. We don't. But what God wants us to do is to live in community, understanding that all of us are in the same boat. I'm same boat. So, confession and forgiveness go hand in hand. However, if we're honest, after we have confessed our private sin to God, many times we walk away from God not truly feeling or embracing that forgiveness. You understand what I'm saying? You go and you say, Lord, oh, I, I did that wrong, forgive me. But you get up and you just don't feel it. Can, I, can we be real? You, you, you just, you get up and you, you still got that Feeling, you still got that blackness, that shadow that seems to follow you. You just can't get out from under it. Mm -hmm. So through, through, through this, and the devil knows that. So the devil will use it as a weapon against us. I know you said that you you went to Lord, but you know you was wrong. Ain't nobody ever did that. And you 
you've saved? Oh, that's the good, that's the good one. Don't you call yourself saved? Lord, that is one of the big tools to keep us <laughs> in guilt and shame. But God also has called us to be priests one to another so that we're not left to those feelings. When you get up and you feel like, you know, I just, I keep coming, but I just don't feel free. I just, I, I don't feel like I have been absolved. All of the promises given and I have to take it at, I have to take the promise at its word. I just still can't quite get it to settle down in my spirit. And so God allows us to be priests one to another. So that we are not left with those feelings by ourselves. God allows us to sit in a place as God and counselor of one another. And this is a good thing because God knows exactly who we are and how we're made. God created us as relational beings and we rely on one another in this Christian journey. And we should be able to rely on one another to be free to exercise the discipline of confession. So through confession, the dark powers that try to hold us are taken out of their carnal isolation and brought into the light. I'll say that again. Through confession, that power, that power that the enemy tries to hold over you is brought out of darkness and into the light. And how many of you know once something has been exposed, it ain't got no more power? Yes. Once something out there is out there. Once you busted, you busted. Once it... <laughs> it's out there now. It's out there. It's out there. Sin is rendered powerless. The devil is disarmed. He can't. He can't come against you with that because you're like. Well, yeah, I, I talked to my spiritual partner. We went to the Lord, but that's the old me. That's something I did in my past. It's not me. It's something that I did, but it's not me. And now, according to Marjorie Thompson in Soul Feast, which is a wonderful book to read concerning spiritual discipline, Soul Feast, we have unlocked a process of spiritual healing, opening us up to forgiveness, cleansing, Reconciliation and renewal. I want us to be honest. Many of us have been looking and longing for a cleansing. We've been looking and longing for a cleansing of your spirit. You didn't know how to achieve it. Or maybe you lost faith that it can actually become a reality for you. A true cleansing. I say again, confession is difficult. Is something that requires great humility and vulnerability. There's an age-old tradition that existed before professional priesthood, and this is how it went. A person would seek out a spiritually mature person, or known as an elder, and they would unburden their souls and receive the assurance of forgiveness. How many of us have given room to that type of relationship in your life? I'm not talking about somebody who's going to encourage you, girl. I would have said the same thing, girl. I would have slapped her three times, girl. I, I ain't talking about <laughs> that person. I'm talking about someone who would challenge you. Someone who you give access to your life. That you give the privilege to rebuke you. Oh, Lord. Now, there we go. Do they still do that? Rebuke? <laughs> there, are we still doing that as Christians? I don't know. Have you given somebody access to rebuke you? To chastise you lovingly? Mm -hmm. To tell you, no, that was wrong, brother. And you have to go back and make it right. Because that is life diminishing. You have to make it right. You, that's going to chase you if you don't make it right. That's going to imprison you if you don't. Somebody in your life like that. I've got about three people that I can call on a dime. Be like, girl, look. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong right now. It's the 
this is how I feel. This is what I see. And they would tell me. They would tell me. But I give them access to that. I give them access to that. This is that person you can call and say, hey, I'm falling. And I'm ashamed of it. I'm struggling with receiving forgiveness from God. In fact, I'm struggling even going to God to ask him for forgiveness. Come on, somebody. Come on. Uh -huh. Things that we've done and we, 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 we intend to, but we just can't even utter it. We can't uh -huh. even get it out. Yes. Come on. Yes. Yes. I'm burdened by it. Richard Foster, uh, he wrote a good book called Celebration of Spiritual Disciplines, and he shares a time when he was experiencing stagnation in his ministry. He sensed that something from his past was impeding his flow with God. So he sat in the presence of the Lord over the span of three days, and he wrote whatever the Lord revealed to him. For three days, he just wrote it. He didn't judge it. He just wrote it. And he compartmentalized his life. So it started from the beginning and just flowed with it. And he made an appointment with his friend counselor and said, I need to see you. And so he took this piece of paper and he went and he read this piece of paper painfully, woefully, read this paper in front of this friend counselor, the person he had given access to his life to help him. And he got ready to put the paper back into the briefcase. But the friend lovingly and wisely reached for the paper, took the paper, ripped it up in a thousand pieces, put it in the wastebasket, prayed a prayer of forgiveness over him, and then prayed a prayer of healing over him. He said at that moment, his whole ministry changed. There was no discussion. There was no judgment. But these are things that he had carried with him for so long. But he had someone in his life who he could be real with. And he didn't have to be ashamed with. And that gift, oh God, that gift that he was given changed his entire ministry. I'm going to say it one more time. Confession is difficult. Can I give us this possible reason why we struggle with confession? Could it be that we often view the believing community as a fellowship of saints before we see it as a fellowship of sinners. I'll say it again. Could we be viewing this place only as the fellowship of saints, forgetting that this is also fellowship of sinners? That's who we are. Saved by grace. Yeah. Yeah. Striving mm -hmm. to please our Father. Yeah. But making some missteps along the way. That's deep. Yes, it is. That's deep. So what we're doing is we're putting pressure on one another mm -hmm. to be perfect when God never required it. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was never part of the formula. Uh -huh. He called us to be in community with freedom and liberty so that we could be our best selves together, one with the other. It's not until we accept the fact that we are first a fellowship of sinners that we are free to hear the unconditional call of God's love and to confess our needs openly before our brothers and sisters. It gives us the opportunity to remind each other that our sins have indeed been forgiven through the finished work on the cross. 
Our sins have already been forgiven. They've already, the work is already done. But that doesn't mean that we don't address the issues. That doesn't mean that we come away from that and now we have a grace card that we can just do whatever we want and then just try to throw it under the blood. Just throw it under there. Just sling it under there. Just sling it under there. Don't address it. Don't pray about it. Just throw, just throw it under the blood. I can see stuff being thrown back out. You want to deal with that? <laughs> that is not ready. <laughs> Come on. It brings us deeper and more fully into the abundant life that has been promised to us. I hope I'm helping somebody. And guess what? This is not a new phenomenon. It's not new. What I've been sharing about today is not new. Anyone who has an experience with healing communities such as Alcoholics Anonymous or adult Christian and alcoholics has seen the same type of healing power of the discipline of confession and forgiveness. They have to be real about it. And when they go in, they say, hi, my name is such and such, and I'm an alcoholic. Now, they could be clean 20 years. But they're forever coming into the community where they can be free. And even if someone comes in and says, I fall, the community receives them. And this is the bonus, saints. Now, help me out. I think it's called a sponsor. Is that right? They get a sponsor, someone whom they can talk to. In the midnight hour, when they're struggling, they can call somebody and say, hey, I'm really wanting a drink. And this person does not say, it is two in the morning. What is wrong with you? Why do you want a drink? You know we don't drink no more. No, that person talks them through it. May say, meet me at the diner. May say, I'm on my way to come get you. Come on, somebody. Yes. Mm -hmm. They undergird one another. Yes. Do you have your sponsor? Mm -hmm. Who's your sponsor? Yes. Who's your sponsor? Do you have somebody you can call me real with? And that's not going to entertain you and keep you right where you are. But they're going to lift you up. They're going to pray with you. They're wise in their counsel. Remember the pilot? On the day of the deposition, he was faced with himself. All of the pain, the brokenness, the hurt, and the darkness that had been plaguing his soul became too much. The company had millions of dollars on the line and his testimony was going to be the make or break in the case. And so he had a choice to make. I can talk how they rehearsed me and keep my answers in line and save the day and then I'll just continue on and Everybody will be happy and well, I can be real. And I can receive my healing. I can be free of the terrors that chase me at night when no one else is around. So he chose to confess to everything. He confessed to the drugging and the drinking. He confessed to the cocaine that morning of the flight. He confessed to drinking the vodka on the plane. But he unburdened himself. And he refused to allow the prison of the lies to hold him any longer. Now he was free. So he went to prison. 
He went to prison. As he should have. As he should have. There are consequences that we have to deal with. God is not obligated to get you out of everything. You, you got to deal with some stuff. Saints, hear me saints. Brothers and sisters, there are consequences. It's just a principle. But while in prison, he was the freest he had ever been. My God. My God. When he was out of prison, behind, outside of the bars, he had no life but a life of guilt, shame, darkness, hidden, hiding. In prison, he was free. Free. He was able to share with others his story and to help others not do what he did. I came to help today. And I came with good news to say there is a release for our burdens. And there is a healing for our souls. And I want to help us to receive true healing and forgiveness today. There is work to be done today. Amen? Amen. So, does everybody have their sheet of paper? Their sheet of paper. Pull your sheet of paper out. If you need to slide over or whatever, this is not a joint effort. This is, this is between you and God. Let me check you up front that this is safe zone. No one sees what's on your paper. So don't let that hinder you. This is between you and God. But God asked me to facilitate an opportunity for us to unburden and receive forgiveness. To confess to the Lord some things that you have not been real with, real about. On this paper, you can write down a phrase, a sentence, one word, something, anything that you would like to give to the Lord that you can be free from your burden of it. You can be absolved of it. Now, there may be many in here who are sin free and God bless you. <laughs> but for those of you that are not and are willing to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to try you at your word. I invite you to write on this paper and then meet me at the front. And we're going to receive healing. We're going to see, receive freedom and liberty from those things that bind you. We're going to play some music. And whenever you're ready, I'm writing too. <laughs> <laughs>